Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The State of Democracy 2021, a conversation with David Brooks and Robert Siegel. Today's program is being recorded. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Following the program, please visit Moment's website, where you can sign up to receive Moment's newsletter, Jewish Politics and Power, and be sure to register for next week's seminar, The Holocaust in Latin America, a conversation with Alain Stavins and Andre Spokoini. Now for today's program. David Brooks is chair of WEAVE, the Social Fabric Project at the Aspen Institute in Washington, D.C. He is a New York Times columnist, a commentator on NPR and PBS NewsHour, and author of five books, including The Road to Character and The Social Mountain. Joining David today is Robert Siegel. For 30 years, Robert was the senior host of NPR award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered. In 2018, Robert was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in journalism. He has been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award. Currently, Robert is a special literary contributor to Moment Magazine and hosts Navigating the New Abnormal, a series of web seminars sponsored by American Friends of Rabin Medical Center on the JBS Jewish Broadcasting Service Television Network. Please welcome David Brooks and Robert Siegel. Suzanne, thank you very much. And David, it's great to see you again. How are you? Be with you after many years of conversing. Yes. Well, uh, the strength of American democracy. Let's let's start with January 6th. Uh, for you, now that we have a little bit of perspective, did it indicate the fragility of American democracy? Did it show all of our weaknesses? Did it show the resilience and the strength of American democratic institutions? It showed a, a lack of bottom. <laughs> I, you know, most people were uh, found it abhorrent what happened, including a lot of Republicans. But there was a ground of decency and the ground of civility, a ground of sacredness that is absent. And I think that's what shocked me on the day. And so during the impeachment, looking at the videos again, that's what shocked me again, which is, you know, like most of us, I vividly recall the first time I was in that building. Mm -hmm. I was 15. I was turned on by politics because I was reading all these books about Watergate. Uh, and I came down to and somehow I got in the building. I don't know what security was like. And I thought if I walked really fast, people would thought would think I belonged there. <laughs> and so I vividly remember walking through the hallways and even getting into the subway that takes you to the Senate office buildings uh, and um, just being overawed by reverence for the place. And I felt that every, I mean, I've been there thousands of times now and I felt it every time since. And, and to walk in that building and not be overawed by reverence is a loss of our civic religion among a lot of people. Well, the, the FBI director has pointed out that uh however many people took part in invading the Congress, uh, by the tens of thousands, people have sent in evidence of, in some cases, their neighbors, their friends, their, their family members who took part. It doesn't seem to have gone over well, is what I'm, I'm, I'm right. trying to no, say, no, I hope. Uh, and uh, do, you, do you feel confident that, uh, that while there may not be an evident bottom, uh, there wasn't on January 6th, that... Uh, that we have some sense of, uh, of uh, we all have sh share in some sense that that is a temple of democracy and that we value it. I guess so, but if you ask people, do you trust the people who work within it? Yeah. Uh, that's about as low as it's been in our history. I saw a Pew research poll this week, which shocked me, which was they asked, are you a Republican, Democrat, or an independent? And for the first time, a full 50% of Americans said, I'm an independent, mm -hmm. and 25 said each of the two parties. And they still, most people still vote for one part or the other, but that's a great sign of, of disillusion with our political institutions. And 50% independence is just nothing we've ever seen before. Do, do you think that there, there is a sufficiently uh, large shared set of understandings of what our democratic values are across party lines, regions, uh, racial lines, uh, enough so that, uh, that we can feel some confidence that whatever else we think, whatever we differ about, you know, there's a basic, there's a basic conviction to something we call our democracy. 
I think there's a joint. <laughs> yeah, no, I do think that. I mean, what I'm trying to describe, I'm not being as upbeat as, <laughs> as your questions imply, because what has been called the democratic recession has been ongoing for about 15 years. I mean, you look globally, mm-hmm. the number of democracies and the quality of democracies has been in decline globally for about 15 years. And we're included in that, um, and especially liberal democracy. And when you have people, I think people believe in voting. People are now voting more often than not. But when you have multiple truths, when you have a Congress that really is incapable of any sort of compromise, uh, then you have to say we're in some kind of re- democratic recession. When I first got to uh, Washington, I interviewed Dick Darman, if you remember him. And Dick budget. was the budget director under the, the first director. president Bush. Yes. And he, and somewhere in that administration, they cut Social Security benefits. And and so that, that was a super hard thing to do. They thought they had to do it to make it more sustainable. And so they had, they had, um, they got all the big figures, including a guy named Claude Pepper, Claude Red Pepper, who was the senior citizens member of Congress, I think from Florida. Yes, and absolutely they, from Florida. Yes. They got him into a meeting and he, they all beat up on him and said, You got to go with a deal. You got to go with a deal. And it was a big bipartisan deal. He finally said, Yes, I'm going to go with a deal. And at 2 a.m., they held a press conference so he wouldn't sleep on it and change his mind. <laughs> and, and that was just a system that was capable of more difficult political legislation than we are capable of. And so I have to think that Americans are committed to democracy. It's our faith. It's, it's what we do. It's our project. But I would not say the health is where it was 20, 30 years ago. I'm curious about the global democratic recession uh, that, that you speak of, because when, when we think of uh, prior global movements, uh, there was, I mean, in, in the 19th century, the working class uh, was, was demanding the vote or getting the vote for the first time. Uh, uh, when, the, when fascism came along, mass media was there to be used for the first time. Uh, what, what's, what is going on in the world that should account for us being concerned about the same things in Turkey, Poland, Hungary, sometimes France or Britain and the United States. Yeah, well, I I think we we too much pay attention to ourselves and not enough to other people. So in in every country almost, there is a Donald Trump figure. There is Marine Le Pen or or something. There is a figure like that. Orban, in almost every country, there's a left-leaning figure who appeals to the young. In almost every country, there's a centrist technocrat, a Macron. And so we, we think, oh, it's just us, but these things are happening everywhere. And my interpretation of that is that in every Western country, certainly, over the last 20 or 30 years, or maybe 40, the information age economy has rewarded highly educated people who move to the cities. And so in almost every country, this group of people who go to nice colleges or universities, they move to Paris, San Francisco, New York, DC, they leave behind rural areas. They leave behind those who don't have the educational credentials. And in almost every country, those people from the rural areas are in revolt. And it's partly an economic revolt, but it's partly a status revolt. Mm-hmm. And it's partly a sense of fear. Those people in the cities control the universities, they control the culture, they control big tech, and now they want to control politics. And the only area where we as non credential elite can compete as politics because there are a lot of us <laughs> and so you see these revolts against the creative class in all these places and i think that's that's one of the big drivers obviously there are other drivers there's globalization a lot of countries are getting a lot more uh, diverse but i would say those are the three big narratives that i think are really driving what's going on well, I mean, if 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 we were to come out of this this recession, at least on our shores, I, I it, it's it's easier to say, oh, it's just about the cratering of the industrial economy in the upper Midwest. You can you yeah. can uh, bring in some uh, either people will move to where the jobs are, or new industries will be will be created. The sense of being culturally sidelined or or ignored or uh, uh, your your the, the bearings that you shared with your parents and grandparents being undone that's a little harder to address i mean how how, how does american democracy deal with that yeah. um, well we <laughs> show of respect mm-hmm. i mean you know i my father taught at NYU i grew up in in lower manhattan mm-hmm. i went to the university of chicago i work at the New York Times. I work at the Aspen Institute. I teach at Yale on NPR and PBS. Like 
Okay, I, I'm in a certain sector. You could wear a sweatshirt saying deep state you. Yeah, right, exactly. And I would say in our sector, and I include that broadly, mm -hmm. universities, media, we have over 40 or 50 years excluded a lot of people. Like among the 5,000 people I know uh, in the top journalism professions or in companies, how many Trump supporters are there? And that, that was a problem that started 30 years ago when what had been a working class profession became an Ivy League profession. And, um, and so once Trump came along, the people who would have been in there uh, sympathizing with them, they were not in media anymore. They were not on faculties anymore. And that was a, a cultural uh, exile that has had great costs in my view. And now it's almost too late because once Trump comes along, it, he distorts the truth. So it's hard to find Trump supporters who will uh, adhere to the standards of factual accuracy that uh, we insist upon. Uh, and so how you, but there has to be some display of respect and frankly, integration. I'm a big believer. There was a sociologist, Gordon Althorpe, who had this thing called contact theory. Mm -hmm. that the only really way to, to heal cleavages is by contact, by social contact with fellowship. And so that has to be done across racial lines, obviously, but also across class lines. Uh, uh, you know, you, um, uh, you, 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 when, when you speak about, uh, well, you're engaged in working with, with, with our civic life, with, with institutions at a local level that are, that are making contact among, among people. Is it, is it happening there as opposed to in Washington, DC? Much more so. So uh, my project, we've at Aspen. This is what we do. We lift up people who are, who are building trust because social trust is a big problem. Who are leaning across difference and who are living in these places. And so you're in McCook, North Carolina. McCook is a town about an hour from Wake Forest, mm -hmm. uh, from Winston Salem, and it was a town where Lowe's Hardware was founded, NASCAR was partly founded, Holly Farms, all those firms left and went to a big city. And so the town was hit hard by the opioid addiction in the 90s. And now they're sort of rallying together to create a renaissance, a revival, and it's slow going, like a lot of rural America, but they are really working together. And, the, and so it does, and people are much happier about their local politics than they are about their national politics. And the thing I love about going to these places, like I, I met a woman in McCook, Nebraska, is that everybody has like nine jobs in a small town. Mm -hmm. So I met a woman who was like, she was a school bus driver. She was a swim coach teacher. She ran the music festival. She ran triathlons. She had nine kids. And she's like Wonder Woman <laughs> doing a million jobs uh, in these places. And it's part of a more engaged civic life than other places. Now I want, I want you to zoom in with me, uh, not at, at the values at large in American life, but at the institutions of our federal government, uh, things like the Electoral College, the, the traditions of the Senate, which include the, the filibuster, somehow we've slipped to you need 60 votes to do anything, the, the bill that Claude Pepper uh, went along with it, I know in the middle of the night wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have been able to pass today in the Senate, given the, uh, uh, g given the rules. Um, do we have a, 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 an American Republic that's built for the 21st century uh, when it, it seems to be, um, uh, it, it is remarkably, in some respects, remarkably unchanged from the late uh, 18th? Yeah, I, so I've been historically been a supporter of the Electoral College mm -hmm. and the filibuster on the grounds that it forces can presidential candidates to go to purple states. And it, it's not enough just to, for a Republican to run up the vote in wherever, Texas and Wyoming, and a Democrat to run up the vote in California. You actually have to go to Ohio, and you have to go to Michigan and Wisconsin. And it, my view is it tends people toward the middle, which is where I am, so that's in my interest. Uh, and for the Electoral College, I do think historically it has caused people to try to work across party lines, which I think is in general a good thing. The problem is the... the um, the filibuster required on a level of goodwill, a, an informal understanding, we will not abuse this privilege. Mm -hmm. And that has completely gone away. And so now if the choice is between doing nothing and ending the filibuster, I'll end the filibuster. I still uh, like the electoral college and I would just 
tell Democrats, well, it's not inevitable that Democrats have no purchase in rural America. If you create a party that appeals to rural America or even a separate wing of your party, you can be competitive there. And I would say the reverse to Republicans. It's not inevitable that they do so badly in cities. Mm -hmm. And I I actually think that's changing. I think if I'm really struck by, as so many are, by how the ethnic groups in cities switched sharply to the Republican side in 2020. Uh, In Chinatowns across America, in Latino neighborhoods of urban across America, there was a sharp shift to the Democrats, to the Republican side. To the Republican Party. And if the Republican Party succeeds, this is a big if, in becoming a multiracial working class coalition, then I think the Electoral College will not be as unfair because the parties will begin to scramble. And parties move. Like, and and Donald Trump won every, as a Republican, won every state but one that William Jennings Bryan won as a Democrat in 1896. Like, complete swapping of coalitions. Uh, And so parties move. And so... I'm sticking with the Electoral College for now. <laughs> but I, you know, your description of, of, of how the filibuster worked when it worked, and I want to hear more about the filibuster from you, but um, it, it seems to be part of a, of a dilemma, which is that it worked the way it worked when the Senate was more of a men's club, when it was a, a, a group of uh, rather like-minded people with fairly similar experiences, but from different places all around the country, uh, who... Um, you know, for the same reason, we didn't hear a lot of stories about their personal lives, uh, because there were understandings that that this was a uh, right. this was this was a you know, there were there was a private things are private. It's a club. Uh, we don't have that because we're more democratized uh, than than we were in those days, and there are more people who are taking part, and more different kinds of people getting elected. And I wonder if if an institution like the filibuster uh, can uh, can ever be used judiciously again. Uh, given the, the the change in our politics, yeah, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, if, if we locate the 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 Senate sort of the base as 1965 passing civil rights and all that kind of stuff, yeah. then it was sort of a white men's club. But it was also a white men's club in 1865 yeah. when we had super polarization, yeah. and so these things ebb and flow in history. I don't think it's the the diver- the greater diversity in the in the Senate, that's the cause of this, partly because it's still not that all that diverse. But uh, it's, but I think it's a mixture of all the reasons that drive uh, polarization that we can talk about. Yeah. But one of them, underappreciated, is just simply the loss of legislative skill. That there were people like Lyndon Johnson who really knew how to do stuff with the body, and uh, there's almost nobody there now who was has a, a lived experience of actively passing complex legislation. Like the last really complicated bill that was passed very successfully was 1986 Tax Reform Act, which was passed in a bipartisan way with Bob Packwood and Daniel Moynihan and uh, people like that. And uh, so the, the skills have deteriorated, aside from everything else, of which there's a lot. Unless you count the, the measure of, of Mitch McConnell's tour in the Senate as being preventing complex legislation from being passed, <laughs> but in which case yeah. you'd have to give him... Great parliamentary stars for having yeah. achieved it. Yeah, stop and the bill. I will say, talking to Republican senators, they have long been frustrated by McConnell in his inability to give them votes on their legislation. They work mm-hmm. on some bill, they're really proud of it, they've got some Democratic sponsors, and McConnell will squanch even a vote. And so that there's pent up demand in the Senate to at least try to vote on stuff. What do you What do you make of this? I I, I think unique moment. I I. I I like to choose the use of unique very carefully. Uh, when in the entire country, uh, in every jurisdiction of the country, there is essentially the same problem uh, being addressed, which is how do we get the vaccine into as many arms as we possibly can in some manner that's uh, fair and that uh, and that works and that uh, uh, people can understand how you get your appointment. It's happening everywhere. I, I can't. I can't recall a, a similar experience like that. And um, and I wonder what you know what you yeah. think of it. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's moderately unique. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. No. There's no. There's no qualifier. It's, unique. it's either unique or unique. I, I guess what strikes me is people are choosing radically different ways to do it. Mm-hmm. B. It's super confusing to everybody I speak to. Uh, uh, C, the results are don't follow any ideological pattern. 
<laughs> and so like Florida and Texas have been pretty open. Uh, and Florida, I looked this up, is ranked 28th in infection rates right now. And it's, so it's pretty open. 27, number 27 is California, which is pretty closed. Mm -hmm. And if you go up and down the, the, uh, the rankings, both in infection rates and vaccine success, there's no super big red, red, blue skew. It's sort of random. And so I don't know what to make of this, except for maybe there's a lot of randomness in life. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, I, I guess the final thing that I would say, and here I go back to my Berkey and conservative roots, is I think the places that messed up put too much faith in complicated government planning mm -hmm. and they issued rules that were just too complicated to work quickly. And, and they've now had to scale those back. I want to ask you about something that, that I find striking, which is the issue of legitimacy, that uh, we do have, according to polls, tens of millions of Americans right now who don't believe that Joe Biden is a legitimate president. We had a fair number of Americans after the 2016 election who found something illegitimate about Donald, uh, Donald Trump's election, either in their opposition to the concept of the Electoral College or the notion that uh, the Russians helped him or whatever it might be. Uh, there were questions uh, raised about uh, George W. Bush's winning the 2000 election when the Supreme Court ended the count in Florida uh, and Al Gore uh, conceded. And then there was the, the birther movement, which I would have dismissed as being insignificant, except that one of its chief advocates became president of the United States. So that would be a, uh, that would be a mistake, I think who cast out on the legitimacy of Barack Obama's presidency. Uh, and I, thi I think, I don't know if you agree, but I, it seems to me different from disagreeing with the president or thinking that, uh, you know, I think on balance, Adlai Stevenson would have made a better president than, uh, than Dwight Eisenhower, and thinking there's something, there's something totally crooked here that I don't really acknowledge. I, I, I think this is, this is not reality, what we're looking at. I mean, that, yeah. that, that seems to be a, a, a problem that's likely to remain with us for some time. Yeah, and we see the effects of it right now. So right now, it's likely that the minimum wage bill will be struck from the COVID-19 relief plan. And we'll probably try to deal with the minimum wage bill on our own, uh, on its own. And so the Democrats like 15, $15 minimum wage. Mitt Romney and uh, Tom Cotton have a $10 plan. And I think Joe Manchin has an $11. And so in theory, Democrats are not gonna get what they want. Republicans are gonna give up more than they want, but we'd meet around 12 or 13 or something because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just numbers. But I suspect that will not happen because Democrats are like, you guys storm the Capitol. We're not gonna compromise with you. And Republicans have the opposite view. And so even when it's something where you should be able to get some bipartisan compromise in the middle, um, I suspect we'll probably get nothing. And that's ultimately motivated by a fear that you're illegitimate. Yeah. And, or at least by some people in your party think that. And that it's just super painful for anybody to cross that line. And I noticed it even in the, during, after January 6th, there are a bunch of groups in Congress that are bipartisan. There's a thing called the Problem Solvers mm -hmm. Caucus in the House and then the Common Sense Caucus in the Senate. And around January 6th, they just stopped meeting. <laughs> they mm -hmm. said, there's no way we're gonna meet and not blow ourselves up. So let's just stop. And so that, that's, that shows how, even among people who are like professionally dedicated to bipartisanship, how a feeling of illegitimacy of the other side is lapping at their shorelines. You, you took me back a moment ago to my to my uh, unique, I will say, I think unique experience at NPR, where I, I was uh, a member of the union, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, Baltimore, Washington, local, and uh, took part from a distance with the union negotiating team uh, several times, but spent one period in the management team when I was running NPR News. Uh, and so uh, I've been on both sides. And, and one rule seemed to be that when you can get a dispute down to two numbers, uh, you're okay because everybody can can do the subtraction and the the, the division of the difference. Um, that should be the winning moment when you're when when you've got uh, Tom Cotton with a number, uh, and uh, it 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 bespeaks doesn't I think it bespeaks a, a systemic failure of our democracy that we can't get off the dime there that we can't that that, that we can't negotiate a compromise to something like that. Yeah, and part it's because nothing is ever about itself. 
Like it's not about the um, this income that's going to people. It's about our the symbol of what we stand for. And and for the Republicans, the Texas just opened up. Masks are not about themselves. Masks are a symbol of us. Yeah. And so everything becomes a symbol of our identity group. And once it's a symbol of your identity group, it's super hard to compromise. And I, I think that's a, one of the core problems here. So on, on, on the Democratic side uh, nowadays, I see certain themes uh, that a party that is, some people say it's much more liberal than it used to be, but it still has, say, in the Senate, the, the testers and now the two Arizona senators and... Uh, 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 some people say Hickenlooper belongs in that group, and of course Joe Manchin of West Virginia. So it's a it's a center left uh, uh, party, and they seem to be uh, uh, they seem to share a desire that the uh, uh, the the common person, I guess I'm going to say, uh, should get a better deal, whether it's by a higher minimum wage, taxing richer people to spend more money on people with le less money, or uh, 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 passing uh, uh, various programs that would assist uh, people in, in financial trouble. I, I still understand what the Democratic Party is about, and I don't think it's that different from what I thought it was about when I first started voting, although in those days it was divided over a war and segregation. What's the Republican Party about? Let's, let's, let's take out you know, the personality of Donald Trump. What, what is it? What, what's at its core now? Wait, we're taking Trump out of it? Well, right, right now it's about Donald Trump. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, I shouldn't make that yeah. position. Hey, you know, I, I think right now, objectively, it's about Donald Trump. If Donald Trump started reading Marx and Engels, everyone would salute and go along with Marx and Engels. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a in the in the bigger picture, it's a party in transition. So when I first started covering the Republican Party, it was the the big argument was capitalism versus the state, and it was the capitalism party. And it's no longer that, it's now the working class party. And this has happened to the Tory party in England, which used to be the Thatcherite party and now represents the Midlands. Um, and the same has become the Republican party. It doesn't quite know what to do with that fact. It knows it's not quite the party of Wall Street anymore, but it hasn't yet fully manifested what does it mean to be a working class party. Yeah. And so you've got a lot of working class voters who are the rank and file, and then a lot of Paul Ryan type legislators who grew up in the age of Reagan, who are still think, oh, we're the Wall Street Journal editorial page party. And so it's it's slowly trying to figure out what that means. There's a guy named Amer uh, Oren Cass, who's got an outfit called American Compass, which is a think tank trying to create a working class agenda. Mm -hmm. And then there are the, the senators who sort of understand this and are trying to do different versions of it. Josh Hawley wants it to be a more anti-immigrant party and, and, and Tom Cotton has another version of it. Marco Rubio has another version. And, but they're all grasping their way toward being a working class party that's conservative on immigration on abortion and social issues, but much more willing to entertain state power, uh, industrial policy to combat the Chinese than the previous Republicans were. And I, I take some hope that if that evolves, it's possible down the road to create some sort of coalitions where we agree. Like right now, there's a weird agreement between some Republicans, namely Mitt Romney and a few others, with some Democrats like Joe Biden on a child tax credit to uh, give families with young kids more money. But it would be, it's not a long list. I mean, if, if we were to look for, for, for many examples of that, uh, it's- uh... I think if like Joe Biden adopted this policy that when U US government does procurement, it only buys American. Mm -hmm. Republicans would definitely agree with that. Uh, in, in theory, infrastructure. Uh, in theory, some sort of industrial policy. Um, so it, it, it's a, I would say it's a growing list simply because the Republican party is no longer as libertarian a party as it used to. I mean, you came up uh, at a time you were you were in college uh, when I, I think when Reagan was uh, was yes. president, and there was a great deal of optimism for young adults coming up associated with Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, a new a, a fresh new set of political ideas coming around. Uh, what what's it like for you? You you wrote a column recently about a letter to a young was it a young conservative or young or, or young oh, Republican? Yeah, uh, I mean. This uh, this doesn't feel like it would be a, a, a great time for the party's outreach to the young. Uh, 
No, I mean, when I came up, first of all, we, we consider ourselves, I worked at National Review, Washington Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, we consider ourselves like we were the ideas party now. Mm -hmm. And my heroes were mostly neoconservatives. It was Irving Kristol and Nat Glazer and Moynihan to some degree. And they had been very smart leftists who'd come over and become neoconservative. And, and a neoconservative in those days was someone who loved the New Deal but didn't like the Great Society. <laughs> and it was a, it was a, a way to fix urban poverty. Other people said a neoconservative was a, a liberal who'd gotten mugged. Was the right by the reality, idea. yes. And so, and so, I, I felt like we were the ideas party. Jack Kemp, I thought, was going to be you know lead a party in a good direction on racial matters, and it seemed very, uh, it seemed like the place to be, <laughs> the place of the future. I'd say it was for a while, but a couple things happened. Once the problems of Reagan Thatcher. We're solving the 70s stagflation. Mm -hmm. And that problem was sort of solved. And over the decades, new problems arose, which they do, and inequality being one of them. And the Republican Party was very ill-suited to even recognize it was a problem, let alone do anything about it for a long time. Uh, and the central argument was no longer the size of the state. The central argument became, how do you deal with the rapidly divided country in all sorts of ways? Uh, culturally, economically, and racially. And the Republican Party was ill-equipped to deal with that. And so now I question whether, if I was 25 and I wrote this column, because a lot of my friends are dedicating their lives to repairing the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I'm like, is that really one how you want to spend your time? Like a party, frankly, is racially retrograde. Uh, a party that seems to believe a lot of things that are untrue. It seems like a big uphill slog. Maybe spend your precious life doing something else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I went into that column believing that's um, maybe time to get out for all you, my friends. But then I thought, and I spoke to them, <laughs> and, and we, we we're going to have two parties. Mm -hmm. And we're either going to have two realistic parties or not. <laughs> and so people within the Republican Party who are young are weirdly in the right place to do some long-term good in the world, which is to build a, a decent Republican Party. And it's easier to build from the bottom where they are. And so I can see, portray that as a noble way to spend your life. Whether you will be successful at that, well, there's not a lot of evidence that the last 10 years have been, have been good for the project. Can, can you imagine uh, within two or four years, uh, Donald Trump's influence over the Republican Party being significantly uh, less than it is now, or should we accept that as a given? I think it will be less. I think he's overvalued. We were overvaluing him into the future, uh, that he, th he thinks he is going to just walk into the nomination. I think people out of power and off Twitter for four years, that really does begin to diminish. I was really struck at CPAC, which is his hardcore. That's the Trumpy of the Trumpy. Mm -hmm. He only got 55% of the votes for who should be our nominee in 2024. Governor DeSantis of Florida was in the 20s somewhere. I, there is a normal human desire for some fresh faces. And maybe nobody can compete as entertainment value, but I, I think he's going to look, um, and I think even his speech was kind of low energy. So I think he'll look a little staler then than he was now. And I would say of his, um, his political talents deteriorated. Mm -hmm. In 2016, I, I have a friend who was serving in the Israeli Defense Forces, and he came back, he was totally out of American politics. And he came back in the middle of Trump and he said, I don't know anything about that guy, but he's really funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he stopped being funny. And so I think part of the magic that he had, at least among his people, is deteriorating. Yeah, I have to confess that the, the only Trump rally that I ever saw that I covered uh, in Iowa and at the University of Northern Iowa, uh, the, it in, included no violence and was clearly the best show on campus that, uh, yeah. if, if not that month, uh, as, as certainly that uh, that week. And people were were taking it in like a like a, uh, a, a, a you know a tent show. It was the, the, this was the uh, the big time coming to coming to town. Yeah, and, uh, I am adjusting. Yes, you're trying right. to. I've got a harsh sunlight. I'm trying to yeah. find a way to get out of the sunlight. There. I want to be in the shadows, a man of mystery. <laughs> in a moment, in a moment, we're going to go to, to, uh, to questions from, uh, uh, from the audience, but I'm still, uh, 
I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. I, I, I place much store by generations, by uh, uh, the experiences that people bring. And I'm, I'm astonished that, that my generation, that is the early baby boom, uh, was electing presidents in, in 1992 and 2000. And uh, then there's this brief moment when Barack Obama, uh, who uh, I found to be a great relief because he wasn't rehashing the same arguments of my, of my generation all the time. But then after him, back to back to somebody who was born in the same, I think it's an 18 month period between 1946 and 47, where you can place both Clintons, George W. Bush, Donald Trump, all the same, all the, all the same age. So I, I, I'm just curious, do you see, I mean, are, do you see interesting people in politics today who are 40 years old or who are who are about to, you know, who, who should be leaders coming up in, 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 in either party? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it really was the, if you were around the class of 68, those are the, those are the people who, and it's, it's interesting to me that, that inflection point on American campus life. Yeah. Because if you go to the yearbooks of 1965, um, everyone's got crew cuts. Mm -hmm. In 1970, they've all got long hair. So it's just a huge cultural pivot aside from Vietnam and all the rest. Um, I should have a better answer because I do speak to young people in Congress who I'm impressed by and whose names I'm now forgetting. <laughs> but, right, okay, there's, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I mean, I'm a fan of Ben Sass, the Republican. I'm a fan of Chris Coons, the Democrat from Delaware. He's a little older. Um, I'm a fan personally of AOC. Uh, met her a few times, found her completely um, intelligent, very intelligent, very warm and friendly, not what I expected from the Twitter presence, which I expected somebody more combative. I really should have a better answer for you. Um, I, I think that's I think that's a good answer. The the uh, SAS, I should say, like uh, like Pauli and Ted Cruz on, on the other end of the bottom right. These are all Ivy League degrees. Uh, it's it's you know it's not as if we're uh, you know the, the candidate from A and M is on the is on the populist ticket. Uh, not at all. If you if you look at all the right wing populists, yeah, you either have a Harvard or Yale MBA, JD. Uh, it's you've got to be you've got to have serious credentials to be a working class candidate these days. Yes, a young a, a, a young friend of mine recently used populist to describe the uh, the investors uh, who were driving a GameStop uh, yeah. uh, up counter, <laughs> counter to the uh, counter to the the short sellers, and I thought that was a a novel take on what a uh, what a populist is, uh, but it's it's uh, very popular. Um, listen, we uh, we're at the point where I think we should be hearing from our our uh, listeners or viewers. I have to get the radio thing out of my head. And Suzanne Borden uh, can actually see the hello, Suzanne uh, can actually see the questions that have been sent in. Yes, and some people also sent questions ahead of time. Uh, so we will get to those uh, as well. Thank you both for that wonderful conversation. Um, I'm gonna combine a few questions here. Uh, with so many people identifying with either the far right or the far left, where does it leave those who are more moderate and centrist? And uh, to go along with that, can the Republican party really heal itself? And could the Republican party split in two? Uh, what would that mean uh, with three part? Could could we survive with three parties? Um, and how could anyone very wealthy, not very wealthy, run for office? Yeah. Um, well, first on on the where the centrists go, I've felt more or less politically homeless for twenty years, so I'm familiar with the feeling. I, I, my heroes are Edmund Burke, who is suspicious of government planning, and Alexander Hamilton, who wants to use government to enhance social mobility. And so that, that makes me in the Whig tradition. If you know 19th century American politics, there were Whigs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm in that tradition, and, but there's no party. And there used to be John Lindsay and Rockefellers and even early Giuliani or John McCain in 2000, but that tradition doesn't exist. And so I would say now you have, you have to make a choice. And I, I think I would be the right word edge of the Democratic party, I guess. Now. Um, but, uh, I haven't made that emotional shift. Uh, so I think it's just sense of homelessness. Will the Republican Party um, recover? I think eventually. <laughs> you know, I, I, as I say, I'm not sure I would spend my life since I'm, I've only got like 20 years of life of professional activity left. But uh, I think eventually we're going to need two parties and eventually there'll be imitation. Can non-rich people run for office? Mm -hmm. uh, it's super easy to 
raise money as if you get to be a presidential candidate. Um, and so I do think they can run for president. Uh, Barack Obama was not rich when he, I mean, in the two, famously in the 2004 convention or the 2000 convention before he gave his big speech, his credit card was turned down at the rental car counter because he didn't have any money. Um, for lower office, uh, it, it's an overwhelming advantage to be rich because you can buy your way to legibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I want to share this f floor with Robert. No, I, 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 I defer to you on that one. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. time in. Um, okay, thank you. And then um, two uh, other ones I'll put together. Um, can you comment on uh, Biden's first, well, we're halfway there to the 100 days. And what do you think the linchpin is to greater moderate Republican support for reasonable Biden legislative proposals? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I think he's done reasonably well with the executive orders. He, he's very good at not putting a foot wrong. So he doesn't make mistakes, <laughs> which is actually he makes it look too easy. So I don't appreciate that. He, it's really hard to rule it with 50-50. By, by third week into the Obama term, they passed Lilly Ledbetter, which was an equal pay act with bipartisan support. They passed a childhood health insurance on week two with bipartisan support. They passed a stimulus package on week three. And that's because they had 57 votes and they could got, find three Republicans. Now it's 50-50, so he just hasn't achieved much legislatively. I think he will get the COVID relief bill and that'll just be a big turbocharge for um, the economy. I saw a Morgan Stanley report today that we're projected to, before the COVID Biden relief bill, to create 675,000 jobs per month this year. We're, our, the average in normal times is 150,000. And so that's just a smoking hot economy. And if we get $101.9 trillion of stimulus, that'll just explode the economy. And so I don't know, I am hoping inflation won't come back, but it'll look, it'll feel like good times once COVID is over and if the economy is roaring along at, at that rate. So you got to give them some credit for that. Yeah, I think we should remember that the 600,000 jobs added per month is still below these 800,000 jobs lost, you know, new, new, yeah. new claims for un, un, unemployment that we're seeing. But I think what, what I find so interesting right now is, oops, did I... Uh, cancel yourself. I, it's the, <laughs> the self-cancel culture. Uh, <laughs> what, what I find so, so interesting is that this could be, you know, the, the, the Washington common uh, popular wisdom, conventional wisdom is that two years after a president is elected, his party loses seats in the House. Uh, and uh, and as David said, the mark of a strong administration is usually a flurry of of big strong legislation when they come in. I think it's just possible to me that this could be different because of COVID. That um, that if in fact the country appears like it's well managed and that we're actually uh, getting the the pandemic under control and vaccinating the country a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, if, if that happens, and that le then leads to an opening up of the economy, and then spending this enormous amount of money that's, that's coming on, it could be a pretty bright-looking uh, administration with remarkably little legislative uh, 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 accomplishments to talk about in another year and a half. So that, that, that's what I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about gerrymandering and should it be prevented and how, and also speak a little bit to voter suppression? What do you, Robert? Uh, Jerry, well, uh, you know, I, in, in principle, uh, I, I believe that the voters should choose their politicians. The politicians should not choose their voters. Uh, and uh, uh, getting to that point in Virginia, where I live and, and vote, has been quite difficult uh, to, to get uh, uh, both parties to agree uh, to some panel that will do this that they don't control and that they don't, that they don't sit on. Um, uh, generally speaking, though, the the, uh, the 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 greatest disproportionate representation that we have in our in our federal government isn't how the House di districts are drawn; it's the Senate, and it's it's the representation, the equal representation, of, of two senators from uh, Alaska and two senators and, and forty whatever it is senators from from uh, California, and that's that's built into our system. Uh, and uh, and I think that that is uh, is is much more problematic for the parties than uh, than the way the districts are drawn legislatively. Yeah, I would just say um, I uh, 
the, when you look at some of the gerrymandering, married, gerrymandered districts, it's crazy the way they're drawn. Uh, but from my reading of the political science literature, it doesn't have as big effect on the overall control of Congress as you might think. That there'd be, if they drew them, if you had an independent commission, maybe eight suites would swing one way or the other. And supporting that is the idea that somehow, it's not true that the House is rapidly polarized and the Senate is a beacon of civility. Mm -hmm. That without gerrymandering in the Senate, then um, uh, you still get pretty bad politics. So um, I, I'd like to see a fix. I'm not sure it would be the cure-all for what ails us. Um, and I, as a resident of DDC, I would very glad we don't have representation. <laughs> <laughs> I know my neighbors. <laughs> Some people would disagree with you. <laughs> I am. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. For that. People who haven't been to Washington recently should know that it was thanks to a fellow who did a politics shot in, on the public radio station for many years that the license plate acquired the uh, the slogan uh, "taxation without representation." That's uh, it's something for when people see it for the first time from out of town, they find it very striking. I think you can get a license, but it doesn't say that. <clears throat> that seems to be by far the most popular. Mm -hmm. uh, someone had an interesting question. Uh, is the failure of members of Congress to work collegially, collegially due, at least in part, to the fact that they do not really know each other? Is it so easy, because it's so easy for them to travel back to their hometowns and cities after spending a few days working in the Capitol? Yeah, on that, he who controls the schedule controls the social life. And so it used to be they'd meet for a couple weeks and then they'd go home. Now they vote from, say, Monday to Wednesday or Monday to Thursday. Uh, and so they all get to go home. And so if you leave Reagan Airport on a Thursday afternoon in normal times, you see it, the plane is filled with members of Congress with the senators up front and the House members in the back. Uh, and, uh, and so they, don't, they generally don't get to know each other. And it used to be when I would meet a member of Congress, my like social icebreaker would be, so does your family live here? Because it was always an issue, do they bring their families or not? And now I don't even ask the question because none of the families live here. Well, they can't afford. It, it, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult now to manage two households or e even just keep a toehold in the district or back home in your home state and actually lead a life in Washington because uh, it's become such a desirable real estate market. I used, I used to get very conflicting versions on this from uh, the late Cokie Roberts, who was a colleague of mine for many years and grew up uh, the daughter of Congressman, uh, first uh, uh, one of the leaders, uh, Hale Boggs, and then her, her mother uh, uh, continued in that, in that seat, Lindy Boggs, after her father died. And she grew up, she said that she grew up socializing with Republican families. It was that it was, it was closer and it, it, it meant something. Um, uh, so I, I, I always took her word for it, but I could swear I've heard other people say that in the good old days, you only stayed with your own party when you socialized and didn't go near the other. So it's, uh, I'd like to see a good history on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, you spoke a little earlier about young people um, and getting involved in the Republican Party. Um, young people participated in the 2020 election in unprecedented numbers. Um, what should the Republican and Democrats be doing to keep them engaged? Well, the, the Republican Party has a gigantic age problem in that young people are not conservative. I, I recall a study... Um, maybe two or three years ago, where they asked for people's political ideology. And among adults 18 to 25, I think 13% said they were conservative. So the Republican Party has done an extremely good job of alienating those voters. So it's got a real problem. The Democratic Party's pro only problem is that a lot of young people are want to drag it so far left that it becomes unelectable. And I, I'm one of those who think the defund the police slogan was a real disaster for the Democratic Party. Uh, and so, but the, the generational politics are pretty incredibly powerful favoring the Democrats. I agree about defund the police having been a real uh, a, a blow. I mean, a, a, a slogan created by a movement whose main point was to, to crystallize their agenda in the slogan and they, they blew it. They came up with a, uh, an idea which they then had to say, doesn't really mean, it doesn't really mean you know, what, what, it doesn't really mean what we're chanting, what we're saying. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that the answer to a lot of our questions is that government has to actually solve real problems in people's lives. 
Uh, and if they did something comparable to what the New Deal did, did during the Depression, a generation will grow up very active with that party. They'll assume that those people know what they're doing. And and I'm at this point, I'm half I'm half persuaded that the the pandemic and the year of vaccination or the first year of vaccination may provide that kind of argument that because uh, there are people volunteering to take part in these things. There, you know the the person who gave my wife her second shot today is an EMT uh, who's who's now on the on, on the uh, vaccinating uh, front and and um, and I think if, if we can see some successes and people could you could honestly say uh, I haven't gotten us into a new war that I can't fully explain uh, people are, are back at work businesses are being created again uh, I don't think you could do much better than that in attracting young people to your party Thank you. A huge swaths of the population are convinced that the election was stolen and also believe in a variety of conspiracy theories. Um, what do you think might help to convince people that what they're believing is not true? Well, to me, that's a, an issue of social trust. Well, we know, we know what doesn't work, which is preventing, presenting them with evidence uh, that only locks in false belief. Uh, if you, uh, you know, I mentioned this a few times, if you ask people, are the people around you trustworthy? In America, it used to be 60% said, yeah, people are trustworthy around me. Now it's about 32 or 33%. Mm -hmm. And among some populations, it's w much lower. It's in the teens. So if your daily life is filled with a sense people are out to get me, you've got a lot of insecurity and anxiety in your life. And you hold on to things that'll make you feel secure. And what conspiracy theories do is one, they allow you to tell yourself you're the smart one and all those other idiots believe this. They give you a sense of agency because you know you're the good people and you know who the bad people are. Uh, and you, it helps you flee from existential anxiety. Hannah Arendt said that all fanaticism flows out of existential anxiety. So to me, the only way to address this is not to attack it directly. It's to attack the emotional anxiety, the emotional sense of unsafety. That's the core of this. And that has to be done economically, but also socially and emotionally. Um, I, I read a good book by an extremist who was a rabid white supremacist. He said, we were all damaged in some way, uh, domestic abuse, something like that. And, and this was a way for us to feel belonging. And once, and this guy came out of the system, once he saw himself loving another person, a Jewish guy who was a psychiatrist who we met, then he felt better about himself and then he could shed the white supremacy. Uh, and so it's a pretty complicated psychological process to which there's no easy fix. I think I would just add to that, which I, I agree with everything David said. I would just add, I think that, uh, that conspiracy theories are especially attractive to people who've had no experience, whatever, of being an authority uh, and, uh, and for, to whom the exercise of power is mysterious um, and, uh, and anything can explain it. And, um, and I think that local government and local activities can be very important in disabusing people of that. If they are invited into activities where you actually get to argue out, you know, whether whether the whether the town should do this or do that, or whether the county should do this or do that, it might it might demystify the uh, the exercise of power a little bit if more people got engaged in such things. Thank you. I'm going to combine another two questions. Um, how do we get to this place where so many of our congressmen and women are more concerned about their own election than what's the best interest of the country? And what do you make of all the black backlash that has occurred with regard to those Republicans who voted for impeachment? I find politicians are motivated by fear of failure. Maybe we all are but they really are, do not want to lose their job. And, and somebody gave me a good psychoanalysis of if you're, if you're especially your senator, but if you're both, if you're a senator, you wake up in the morning, you have a staff of 60 to 80 <laughs> who are there to look after you. And they do your dry cleaning. They take care of your doctor's appointments. They tell you what to say. They drive you places. And losing that after you've had it for 20 years, it's just like, that's my life. <laughs> and so they're willing to do anything to, to keep that. Uh, and a few people are willing to do it. This guy Kinzinger who voted for impeachment, the Republican. Um, but a lot are just, they don't want to lose that, even though a lot of them in Congress right now are bored because they don't feel they're achieving all that much. Um, so it, yeah, I, it's tough to embrace 
what's defined as failure, which is losing a relay. A, a very veteran Washington journalist was once, we were once at an event together and he saw, uh, he saw Bernie Kalb enter. He'd been a former CBS correspondent who'd gone to work as the spokesman for the State Department and uh, was asked to uh, say something that was uh, that he that was untrue as spokesman, which I think he did, and then he quit. He quit. He, he was only in the job for a few days, and and he quit because it was his understanding he wouldn't be required to say anything untrue. And the very veteran old journalist said to me, "Let's go over and give Bernie Cab a pat on the back. It's really rare that somebody quits a job on principle in this city, and, and, uh, probably in any city." Uh, and I think that uh, it's, I, 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 I get very annoyed when I see politicians who I think are not willing to do what Kinzinger is willing to do. But realistically, uh, I, I haven't worked with that many people who were willing to put their job on the line uh, uh, commonly. So mm -hmm. they're human. Um, how did we get into the situation where one man, in the instance of you were talking about Senator McConnell, could block legislation so that nothing gets done in Congress? Why bother to elect senators or representatives if their votes and voices don't count? Yeah, this is the trend I've noticed through my career, which is that power has concentrated in the leadership in both parties. So we elect these 435 House members, 100 senators, but what we really have are three presidents. We have a president who sits in the Oval Office. We have a president who sits in the Senate Majority Leader's Office. And then we have a president who sits in the Speaker's Office. And they have immense power to set the agenda. And the people who used to have a lot of power, the committee chairman, have a lot less. And the members, the backbenchers, who used to be social entrepreneurs and come up with their own policy agenda, which they would then try to force on leadership, uh, they don't do that kind of entrepreneurship as much anymore. Their only hope is to form a caucus that will intimidate the leader by making the place ungovernable. And so I don't, I tell members of Congress, you were elected just like Mitch McConnell, you were elected just like Nancy Pelosi, why are you giving away your power? But they do, <laughs> they, mostly because they're afraid of the consequences if they don't. Okay. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up in a minute, but um, do you have any comments on the Supreme Court and the cases uh, that are ahead this year and what impact that may have on our democracy? If you do, Robert. This, we, the, my brain doesn't have room for everything, so I've never covered the Supreme Court. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> being, having retired and, uh, and it being difficult to go to NPR, having been inside the building for the past year, I don't get to see Nina Totenberg anymore. I only, I only talk on the phone once in a while, so I, I don't know anything about the Supreme Court term. Okay. Um, and so we are going to wrap up with one last question. Um, before we do, uh, David, people have asked if you could mention the name of your books that we mentioned at the beginning. Sure. Happy to do that. All available on Amazon for like 14 bucks. Um, my most recent book is The Second Mountain, The Quest for Moral Life. The previous one was called The Road to Character, which was about how to build character. The one before that was called The Social Animal, which was about um, our, our unconscious processes and emotion. I had to write a book about emotion to know what it is. <laughs> and the one before that was Bohemians or Bobos? Uh, the, my first one was called Bobos in Paradise, which was about the creation of restoration hardware and sort of bourgeois, where Robert lives. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you. And, and finally, uh, uh, would both of you like to comment um, looking forward to the, the next year, the state of democracy um, and what we can expect, what we hope to expect? I'll say in the double negative what I said in the positive before. I'll, I'll put it this way. If, if the federal government combined with state and local government, if they fail to vaccinate the entire country uh, over the next six to seven months, uh, then we're in for a political disaster. Uh, I happen to be fairly hopeful that they'll succeed, but if, if we blow this on the pandemic and see big shutdowns uh, in next year, uh, then I think the loss of confidence in both parties and local federals, they will just be disastrous. And I, I do not think that's gonna happen. And I would just say, first, I wanna apologize for the way I look. I'm looking at a beautiful <laughs> sunset. <laughs> but you're looking at a guy who's got harsh light in his face uh, or shadow. Um, yeah, I, I think my main anticipation is that we've been addicted to politics for five years. 
And I'm hoping and, and already achieving, seeing that politics is getting a little more boring, which would be appropriate. There's a lot more to life than hanging your own everyday happiness on how outraged you are by the political moment. And so there's a lot more delight in life. And I'm hoping by July, we will be tasting it. And though people should definitely read the New York Times every day. <laughs> and Moment Magazine. And Moment Magazine. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you both David and Robert for this great conversation. Uh, thank you to the audience for watching. I'm sorry that we could not get to all of the questions uh, today. Uh, we will be receiving uh, a follow-up email and I will put a link into it to uh, David's book so you can find them. Don't worry about having to write them down so quickly. Um, and please uh, visit Moment's website at momentmag.com, again, where you can subscribe to the magazine. And uh, please register for next week's Zoominar on the Holocaust in Latin America. And if you've enjoyed today's program, we kindly ask you to consider making a donation so that we can continue these programs for you. Again, thanks, David. Thanks, Robert. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank Bye. You. Thanks so much.